Welcome to Vanished Veil, vale, the series where we take you to Vale's special places. Now, last time, we explored the history of the Mormon Battalion and the context of the Mexican-American War. Today, we're going to explore how the aftermath of the war impacted the Tucson Valley. The Mexican-American War had a profound effect on the way the United States and Mexico saw each other. Before the Mexican-American War, they held shared ideas of being Enlightenment-inspired republics of former kingdoms, and they shared common goals and dreams. But the violence and rhetoric of the war shattered feelings of camaraderie, and its reverberations, which are still felt today, made signing a peace treaty tricky. After two long, bloody years of conflict, the United States, predominantly through superior logistics and having a much larger economy to support a sustained war effort, marched into Mexico City. The unyielding efforts of the anti-war movement forced Polk and many expansionists to back down from their original ambitions to seize all of Mexico and settle on all the territory down to the 26th parallel. But they were thousands of miles away in Washington, D.C., and the negotiations were being handled by Nicholas Trist, chief clerk of the State Department. Trist attempted to broker a fair peace and minimize the land ceded to the United States. Mexico had fought for decades to expand citizenship and abolish slavery. With the United States poised to take over huge swaths of their land, many Mexicans were at risk of losing their citizenship, and Southern slave owners were chomping at the bit to bring plantation slavery to the newly seized territories. One of the provisions made in the peace treaty that Mexico was adamant about was that all Mexican citizens, about 100,000 now inside the territorial boundaries of the United States, would have citizenship. At the time in the United States, white men were the only people eligible for full citizenship and the vote. So a caveat had to be made that there would be no distinction between Hispanic and white. You are most likely familiar with the lingering effects of this today. On survey forms, questionnaires, and the census, you will be asked about your race, but there is no option for Hispanic. It's a secondary category. This is a legacy of the racism of the era when the United States had a race-based citizenry exclusively for whites, but needed to carve out a space for the Mexicans they subsumed in the war. Additionally, Mexico wanted a provision banning slavery from all newly acquired territories. This echoed the failed but very influential Wilmot Proviso that had been proposed in Congress to stop the spread of slavery to any territories acquired in the war. However, this issue would not be settled in the peace treaty and the resulting tensions between slave states and free states would build the powder keg of the Civil War. The other major provision Mexico wanted was for the United States Army to provide protection from both Comanche and Apache assaults for all American and Mexican subjects along the border. President Polk was infuriated with the concessions and fired Chief Clerk Trist. But Trist stayed in Mexico anyway and negotiated a peace treaty. The peace delegation chose the symbolic cathedral in the town of Guadalupe Hidalgo to sign the treaty, which gives the treaty its unofficial but most commonly used name. Trist restrained the depths of American expansionism, but not by much. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ceded 55% of Mexican land claims to the United States and made the Gila River the new international border. Now, I bet you've noticed that when you're looking at the map, that Tucson and Vail are still in Mexico. Well, to learn about how Tucson and the Vail area would end up in the United States, JJ is going to meet with historian Dave Devine over at Presidio San Agustin del Tucson, and she's going to learn more about the Gadsden Purchase. Let's head over there now. Hey, Dave. Hey, how are you, JJ? Great, great to see you. Thanks so much for meeting us down here at the Presidio. Well, thank you for inviting I, me. Oh man, I can't wait to hear more about the Gaston Purchase and really how it affects our life today. So let's go on in. All right. Southerners saw the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo as a attempt to thwart their efforts to get a Southern Transcontinental Railway. In 1852, a man by the name of Franklin Pierce was elected President of the United States. And Pierce named as his Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, who was a Senator from Mississippi. Jefferson Davis was a strong supporter of the Southern Transcontinental Rail Line. And his suggestion to the president was, we need to acquire more land south of the Gila River, which will allow the Southern Transcontinental Rail Line to be built easily and cheaply. 
And because the Southern line will be the only line which will be weather winter free. Uh, Davis suggested his acquaintance, Southern South Carolina Railroad Executive, James Gadsden, be sent to Mexico as ambassador to negotiate another treaty with Mexico to acquire even more land. And Gadsden went in 1853 to Mexico City. Now he had quite an impressive title. He did, and I I, oh. I, I have it in my book. Oh, yes. I, yes. Should I read it? Oh, yes, let's do. Okay. I just thought, oh, that is incredible. And, and plus, <laughs> you know, the other thing that's so um, interesting really is how all of these individuals um, managed to bring their personal and <laughs> their regional agendas Absolutely. to the table and, and push them forward. Can you imagine if... Jefferson Davis and Gas, I mean, potentially Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico could have come into the union as slave states. That is correct. And that would have changed the whole history of this country. Talk about how that would have changed history. Right. So James Gaston was named Envoy Extraordinaire and Minister Plenty Potentate to Mexico in May of 1853. <laughs> So, I just wonder but, but, because it just know, means he, ambassador. I know, but, you know, he had some hesitation about taking the, the position because <laughs> he, he was did, having some he was an old man. He was an old man. Right. So I feel like that was like the little cherry on the Sunday. <laughs> well, oh, well, if you go, then you're going to get this incredible title too. <laughs> well, but uh, again, he was a railroad man. That's mm -hmm. how he had made his living, other than running a plantation with slaves. He, I'm sure, saw this as a way to try and get the land needed mm -hmm. for what he had been pushing for a long time. Well, their vision, things. really, not of what the railroad would also bring politically in, in that states correct. that would have the same vision for how right. business should be run. And it was also seen as an economic bonanza for whichever region of the country got the Transcontinental Railroad mm -hmm. because they saw this as being and not only getting uh, goods to the West Coast and possibly to China, but along the way, because these engines needed water, mm -hmm. you were have communities spring up every 30 to 40 miles because you needed to get more water to those engines. Mm -hmm. And so those communities then would uh, grow and you would have all these settlements in land which was completely uh, uninhabited except by native peoples. And so it was seen as a really big bonanza for whichever part of the country got it. And the way you said that, it's uninhabited except for Native, Native people. Americans. Yeah. No, and and was there much consideration that these people were already making their homes there? None. What they did is they objected to uh, Americans uh, invading their country. Mm -hmm. And so they fought back. Um, and uh, which seems fairly reasonable. Seems reasonable to me. <laughs> right, uh, but most Native peoples were not that way. You yeah. know, and, and each one of those, because there were many cities really vying to be that hub where the railroad was going to extend to the West, that was gonna be a huge economic. Uh, that, that was, it was oh, seen, man. Uh, and so you had, so there were the four competing possible routes, mm -hmm. the northern route, the north central route, the south central route, and then the 32nd parallel. Mm -hmm. And they were each starting from a different community along or near the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And so it was seen, as you said, as a major economic bonanza for whichever community got to have that plum. Mm -hmm. And, so, and I would say people are going to fight tooth and nail all the well, way up into the Congress uh, and Senate well, for that. People talk about gridlock now, <laughs> at least about the railroad. It was gridlock for 20 years because every region of the country, their senators said, we're getting it and I'm not no voting for anybody else. And so nothing was done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they couldn't compromise. But before that, mm -hmm. <laughs> so James Gaston went to Mexico in 1853, and he was told uh, by the administration in Washington his primary responsibility to was acquire more land south of the Gila River for a Southern Transcontinental Rail Line. At that time, the Mexican government was under the dictatorship of Santa Ana, and there was a rebellion brewing against Santa Ana, 
And so he needed money to finance an army to try and put that rebellion down. Uh, and so he was going to be a willing participant in this, not only because he needed money, but because it was made clear to him, you either sell it to us or we're taking it militarily. I, I, there was, the United States was not going to fool around here. We were going to acquire more land south of the Gila River one way or the other. It didn't matter if it was salary belonging to somebody else, we needed it. <laughs> that, that is correct. And, and that so is we all it takes. It. <laughs> and so they had negotiations and at the end of 1853, they came up with a treaty, which was going to bring in enough land to build a Southern Transcontinental Rail Line south of the Gila River. And that boundary basically was a triangular shaped line. And then it went up uh, to about eight miles north of where the Colorado empties into the Gulf of California. California. When the treaty went to Washington for approval by the U.S. Senate, because that's the way American treaties are supposed to be approved, it couldn't get enough votes for passage. So still, everybody is really championing their own interests. Absolutely. Northern states, the senators from northern states were opposed to it because they feared it was going to create more uh, slaveholding states. Senators from the middle of the country were afraid that it was going to allow the Southern Transcontinental Rail Line to be built which had distinct climatic advantages over their regions. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Jefferson Davis and some other Southerners uh, and some Eastern uh, newspapers said, this is a, a great advantage to us because it will allow this railroad to be built. And so politics went on for a while in Washington and the boundary was redrawn completely by the U.S. Senate. That is not Gadsden's line. That is the U.S. Senate's line. The price uh, for the purchase was dropped to $10 million, mm -hmm. only seven million of which was ever paid as far as I could tell. A Mexican suggestion, uh, which they had first brought up under the Treaty of Guadalupe Lago, is that slavery should not be allowed mm -hmm. in this er new area because slavery had been outlawed by the Mexican government shortly after the country of Mexico was created. But that was a non-starter in, uh, in Washington because we had slaveholding states. And so uh, the treaty was basically completely rewritten uh, in the U.S. Senate, it was finally ratified even though President Pierce was not a big fan of the treaty, uh, and then it was approved. And James Gadsden then repudiated the very treaty that bore his name because he thought it was imposing conditions on Mexico, which one country should not do to another. It was basically humiliating the Mexican government to get this money that Santa Ana was gonna to use to hire an army to fight off these, this insurgency, which of course didn't work because by the end of 1854, he was out of power anyways. So um, Gaston said uh, he did not claim any uh, authorship of the treaty that bore his name. Anyway, so after the Gadsden Purchase, this site of the Presidio uh -huh. transferred from Mexico to the United States. And as people still like to say, mm -hmm. we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. For Mexican Americans who were living that there. That is correct. That is and correct. so the border went mm -hmm. down south to its present uh, delineation, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Nogales and other places along the border. But that didn't change this area for a couple of years uh, because it, this was out here, right? And out the, in the wilderness. And so it would be a couple more years before American soldiers got here. And uh, the American soldiers uh, were sent to do the same thing the Mexican soldiers were here. And that was to protect this area from Apache attacks. Mm -hmm. um, and that was not done very successfully, but uh, that was uh, why the Presidio uh, became an American fort, basically. The people who lived here became American citizens. And the other thing it did is it started encouraging uh, people from Americans, as they were called, which that, that meant white men, uh, many of whom were from Europe originally, mm -hmm. to move out here looking to make their fortune. 
Uh, some of them had been unsuccessful business people on the East Coast. Others were just young men who were looking to uh, uh, make it in life on their own. And so they started coming out here and settling in the Presidio and immediately took over the politics of this area. Mm -hmm. uh, there were votes taken back then and the only people who could vote were white men. That was the way it was until the Civil War started in 1861 when uh, the white men living in the Presidio voted to join the Confederacy. And they uh, sent a representative to Richmond, Virginia. And, and of course, the Confederacy was under the leadership of President Jefferson Davis. Mm -hmm. And they sent a representative to Richmond asking to uh, have this area, basically the Gadsden Purchase area, become a territory of the Confederate States of America. And that happened in 1862. And one of the stipulations that was part of that uh, legislation was that slavery was to be encouraged in this area. The other thing that happened in 1862, of course, was uh, American troops had been withdrawn from Tucson because there was a fear that the Confederacy might try and attack California or that they were attacking in New Mexico. And so the troops in the Presidio were sent to New Mexico. And um, so that left the people who were here undefended, right? Mm -hmm. And so the Confederacy saw an opening. And so they sent a few hundred soldiers from Texas to Tucson in 1862. And so for several months, uh, a Confederate flag flew over the Presidio of Tucson. Eventually, of course, uh, a thousand or so troops from the from California came and they didn't drive them away when the Confederates found out that those troops were coming. <laughs> they took off and headed east um, and went back to Texas. Tucson was then reclaimed by the United States government. But what was more important in Washington happening in 1863, so the Civil War had begun in 1861. Uh, what was it, a dozen Southern states had seceded. That meant the political power in Washington had shifted dramatically. Yes. There was no longer in a impediment to a transcontinental rail line being built mm -hmm. because uh, there were no Southerners to oppose it. It's fascinating how the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Gadsden Purchase laid the foundations for the Southern Arizona that we call home today. Join us next time when we'll explore the politics and power struggles that brought a transcontinental rail line right through Vail in Southern Arizona. See you next time.